Gregor Mele, thank you very much. It's such an honor having you here in Barcelona. It's a great pleasure. So let's talk yoga. <laughs> let's start with yeah. yoga. Okay. Because the feeling, uh, reading your books and following a little bit your, your teachings, is that there, there is, there's been an evolution in your teaching. Mm. The first books, asana, but philosophy and asana, and then asana and mythology, and then pranayama then meditation, and then purpose of your life, and it's the feeling, you know, mudras, um, evolution, like the feeling is that you're opening your teachings um, to yogis and, and maybe to other spiritual uh, paths too. On the same time, I'm observing in this city, which is my city for adoption, that there's more and more people practicing yoga, Every day, more people, more studios opening, but there is a sort of a limit, you know, which is asana. And somehow people get uh, stuck to asana in, in, in sort of um, vicious circle where they identify with their body, with the asana, with the progression, everything. And then you have, we have a teacher like you that seems to go in the opposite way, so to open from the asana mm -hmm. to the more subtle way of working. So my question is, you're traveling also a, a lot around the world, so you know a little bit, you have a taste of the practice of yoga in, in the four continents. So the, the question is, what does yoga can do today in this huge crisis we are living? What's the role of yoga? And if what is the relation between the classic yoga, Ashtanga yoga, Patanjali yoga, even medieval, uh, and modern yoga. So if, if the modernity or the contemporaneity of yoga somehow is uh, creating a, uh, a damage, or it's maybe opening yoga to a larger public and helping the world for uh, a quicker um, wake up. <clears throat> so if you look at the history of yoga itself, we notice that um, Yoga started very abstract and very spiritual when we look at the Vedas and the Upanishads and then later the sutras were written and the Puranas and then after that the Tantras. Um, the, um, the development was for yoga to become more and more, let's say, um, physical. Yeah? And this is because our, our civilization from its indigenous roots, which was very spiritual, became more materialistic reductionist. Yeah? And so while we had materialism already 300, 400, 500 years ago, materialistic reductionism where everything is reduced to the body and to matter is an idea that comes or that gained, became popular in the 20th century. And so during that time, obviously, in the late, particularly after World War II. Yeah? And of course, that was the time also when yoga came to the West. And you can say that yoga in the last 1000 years became very, very physical. This is something that you don't observe so much in very old yoga texts. They are more abstract, they're more philosophical, they are more mystical. And so yoga adapted over very long history to, um, to uh, let's say, cater to the needs of the humanity at that time. So the very, very various phases, probably four main phases that yoga went through. In Indian philosophy, we call them yugas, as opposed to yoga, so that means um, world ages. And so the last one, obviously, that we are now in is uh, a, a stage in which the identification with the body is very strong and yoga caters for that by offering asana. So the idea is that um, somebody, uh, a student comes, explores asana and then gradually gains trust and then wants to do a bit more. This is exactly what happened to me too. I was, um, although I was uh, at a very young age already very spiritual and hunting mystical experiences. 
um, when I came to yoga, I just looked at it as spiritual gymnastics. I couldn't make the connection yeah, that you would do something physical to have spiritual experiences. So like a lot of other modern people, I started doing yoga because I started yoga for the physical benefit. Yeah. And when the physical benefit manifested, I said, okay, let's take it a step further. Start to do the yoga breathing exercises too. And then I realized that they were also delivering on the promise that they gave. And then I had the trust to start with yoga meditation and so on. Yeah. So the idea is that most people will do this journey reversely. And, and, and that's how it's, it's actually organized. Yeah. Whereas the old, the oldest yogic techniques such as samadhi, revelation, they are the oldest yogic techniques. Yeah. But we are now, you could say, reverse engineering. You know, we're starting with the last, uh, major limb that was introduced, which is asana. And from there go backwards in history, you could say. You don't have the feeling that, uh, as opposed to other spiritual traditions in the yoga world today, most people stay in the asana, don't move from there? Yes. Yes, that is true. Yeah. Um, but you probably also have to see that the way how yoga is marketed is that it's basically like, a, um, let, how do we call it? It's a form of gymnastics mm -hmm. that people do for spiritual benefits. Yeah, I used to, years and years ago, people asked me, were quite surprised that there was meditation, breathing exercises attached mm -hmm. to it. So th that's, that's the way how it's marketed, how it's, it's put to the public, that they come with that uh, um, impression that is mainly about tying yourself into knots. Mm -hmm. People even think that you can't do it unless you're very flexible. So, mm -hmm. you know, we can't be surprised about that because that's how it is, is put to people. Yeah. So that's the idea that with what they, with which they come to it. But don't you think that we are, we are reaching an era in which spiritual tradition really need to talk to each other? Spiritual tradition need to talk to each other. Um, and uh, as I see it, maybe it's just a personal opinion, is that an excess of asana uh, somehow uh, doesn't allow yoga to, pre to present itself as a real spiritual tradition compared to uh, Buddhism or to certain you know, or other spiritual yes. tradition, even in Christianity or in Judaism yeah. or in Islam, in Sufism, mm -hmm. uh, etc. You know? And yoga stays there as, 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 as a gymnastic mm -hmm. beside a very small el elite that decide to go and, and study more and stuff. You know? That's correct. But you have to also see that, you know, let's say Buddhism is a very small um, niche. Yeah, you don't have in every big city where you go 50 Buddhist centers, mm. but you have 50 yoga schools. So it's become a mass article. Yeah. So, and I think that probably the majority of, of the population is materialistic. You know, I just, you know, it's not a criticism, that just how it is. Yeah. And that they don't, they don't come to yoga to get anything else out of it, you know. They wouldn't be attracted to Buddhism, for example, mm. because they're not looking for a spiritual path. Mm. Okay. So, we change a little bit of subject, and um, let's talk about a little bit about meditation, because there is also like starting movement in yoga, asking for more meditation. And a little bit of confusion on how to teach meditation, how to practice meditation. Um, this idea of uh, the white wall, no, so seats, and uh, and uh, also this sentence which I heard many times speaking about relationship between traditions, no, yogi in the body and Buddhist in the mind. Uh, what do you think about that? Do you think that, when I, I know the answer, obviously, because I read your books, but it's very interesting to know your opinion on 
uh, the relationship between yoga and the practice of meditation? Mm. Mm. Well, I think it is a great shame and it's a, a, a mischance. Um, you know, I was a practicing Buddhist for quite some time and I, um, you know, I'm initiated in two schools of Tibetan Buddhism and we didn't practice asana. Of course, there was a physical aspect to the practice also, which was called nundro, that is um, um, prostrations. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, I think it's a mischance to... Um, I, can see, I can see the lure. And the lure is simply, um, I think that a lot of people are so overloaded in the mind and so stressed out that they um, want to come to a meditation technique which is totally, absolutely simple, where you practice, where more or less have to do very little apart from detach yourself from your thoughts. Yeah. So I can see that lure at the same time um, I think that uh, yogic meditation is extremely powerful and a chance is missed by not exploring it. Do you think that, I mean, is it uh, possible? Is it, it does, it does, does it make sense practicing asana and then meditating in different spiritual uh, tradition, according to you? Well, you know, let's put it like that. Um, we live in a free country, so it's, it's, it's allowed to do it. You know, the question is, would it be um, superior to doing just asana and no meditation at all? No. Would it be uh, no, no, superior no, hang, to... Hang on. Oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry I and and I would say yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're probably better off to practice any meditation whatsoever than uh, practicing no meditation at all, yeah? But it's the yogi meditation that is designed and created together with yogi asana and together with yogi breathing, um, where you use the same structural elements that you have already created. So you could say they are, these techniques are all interdigitating and feathering into each other so that they're supporting each other. So, you know, from my point of view, um, it is the uh, more effective meditation system when you, if you're already practicing asana. Mm. Okay, we speak about um, body. We speak, we speak a, little, a little bit about... Um, uh, let's speak a little bit about the pranic system. How you... The, the relationship between a mystical state and a pranic balance. The feeling sometimes is that you can, you can watch it on, on, from both directions. No? If you reach a, a certain mystical state, it means that your pranic balance will be a specific one, but you will also reach the mystical state if in, induced by a certain pranic balance. Is that correct in the yoga system? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the pranayama or the prana in relation to um, special experiences, I think the best thing is to first understand that when you look at the way how yoga looks at body, breath and mind is similar to how we would look at in physics, it's states of aggregate, mm -hmm. which would be um, the solid state, the liquid state, and the gaseous state, yeah? So when you look at, for example, at water, H2O, if you um, cool it down, that means you take energy out of it, you will decelerate the particles, and then it becomes solid, yeah? So under zero degrees, it becomes solid. But if you add energy, and you are um, uh, heating it, at some point it crosses the threshold to, of zero degrees, becomes liquid again. If you heat it even more, you add more energy, it becomes gaseous. And this is because the particles start to move so fast that some of them start to breach the surface and they become steam. In yoga, we say that's the relation between body, breath, and mind. Okay. Yeah? So if you look at the pranic um, state, the prana is the liquid state. <clears throat> if you decelerate, it becomes physical tissue. 
If you accelerate it, if you add more energy, it becomes the mind, it becomes thought. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's why A, pranayama, pranic practice is extremely important as a, as a bridging practice between asana and, prana and, and meditation. Yeah? But it's also um, because over, through pranayama you influence the prana and that profoundly influences the mind. So you, we would reach the, the, the great mystery of uh, Pratyahara at the same time. No? It's, that's because, right. Independence yeah. of, from sensory stimulus. Exactly. That's right. Are there techniques, specific techniques of Pratyahara? Because sometimes when you go to a yoga school, you study asana and you teach a lot of techniques for asana, pranayama, and then meditation too. But in Pratyahara, which is defined in the Yoga Sutra and... Um, there are no many techniques usually taught in, uh, yeah. in, in the schools. There is basically an entire school, or strictly speaking, there are three different schools, three different approaches to Pratyahara. So that is independence from sensory stimulus. Because as long as you are hunting for stimulus, uh, um, sensory stimulus, or let's call it external stimulus, it's very, very difficult to um, attain uh, special breakthrough experiences because you need to always go out and stimulate yourself again through food, uh, through money, through power, through sex, whatever it is. Yeah, So we are dependent on these stimuli. So we want to be independent first. Yeah, And there are three basic approaches, which is um, uh, a, a physical approach, a pranic approach and a mental approach. Yeah. So the physical approach <clears throat> is mentioned in a text called the Gohaksha Shataka, mm -hmm. and that means to invert the body for extended periods, so the prana is arrested in what we call the Agna Chakra or the Vishuddha Chakra. This is the technique uh, uh, su um, suggested by the Hatha Yogis. <clears throat> and then in texts such as the um, yoga Yagna Valkya or the Vasishta Sangita, which are Vedic forms of yoga, you have the suggestion that the prana should be cycled during pranayama through the various chakras. Um, so that's the Vedic pranayama approach. And then in Raja Yoga, um, we have that the uh, the prana is projected back into the body by using mudras. Yeah? So there's a lot of different mudras. For example, this one here is called Shambhavi Mudra. You would use that to draw um, visual prana back into the body. Then there is Jiva Bandha rolling the tongue back. You would use that to do, use project gastatory prana back into the body. Or you can use Hasta Mudras. It was, would be in Hasta, Hasta Mudra, but it only works in relation to tactile kinesthetic tactile prana to be um, a, a, uh, to be projected out of the body yeah so <clears throat> all of these mudras would be done you would learn them in sequence mm. and then of course you would do them in a meditation technique simultaneously and the most powerful way is to approach to combine all of these three ways you know to combine the hatha way the vedic pranayama way and the raja way and to form them into one practice, then <clears throat> Pratyahara is obtained the fastest. Okay. It's a reminder that you wrote a book about mudras that yes. it's uh, available. Um, and then the last uh, part no, of, of the Ashtanga Yoga, uh, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi. Um, is it possible to achieve, uh, according to you, a mystical state? Uh, in a city like Barcelona, for example, so chaotic, uh, with pollution and noise, and, and, and like I remember another another teacher that said uh, Manhattan is the best place to practice yoga. No, it's the best place to, to practice pratyahara and stuff. And my feeling uh, when I was listening to it in New York, with this, well, I'm I'm not from there, and I had a, a sense of want to leave this place as soon as I can, uh, it's impossible. My feeling was it's impossible. You really need, I, I, I don't want to say that you need to be isolated from society, on the contrary, uh, but you also have to, I, I'm asking you if it's, uh, 
uh, if you if you think that it's possible in a big city to to to, to reach a very high mystical state. So, firstly, I find Manhattan fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, I've uh, been there a few times, and every time something uh, unexpected happened, and that is, I seem to be hovering off my bed and 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 is floating sort of. 30 centimeters above my bed and it seemed to that I couldn't like settle down. Yeah. yeah. Like I was so full of energy, I couldn't really sleep. Yeah. So um, now there's two things that we need to look at. And, and one is ultimately mystical states are powered by your sadhana, yeah, by your spiritual practice. So in other words, what I want to say is that mystical states also follow the cause and effect equation. Mm. They're not something that uh, spontaneously, totally unexpected um, burst from the blue sky. If they seem to do that, it's because through long spiritual practice, you have um, uh, achieved a critical mass where your subconscious mind suddenly shifts. Yeah, and then it seems to be spontaneous. Could be, you know, know, previous lives. Uh, you know, Ra Ramana Maharishi said that. You know, Ramana Maharishi was an Indian saint who seemed to, although he did practice severe sadhana for a really long time, but it sort of seemed to, when it suddenly matured, it seemed to be spontaneous, you know, and he was marketed in, in Western society then as somebody who didn't do anything to get where he was, but that's what was not true. When you read the books um, where he was interviewed by Indians that are published in India, he clearly said, I don't make, make no mistake, Everybody who seems to have um, uh, attained any form of spiritual experience spontaneously has done the hard work in previous life. However, Ramana did a lot of hard work in that lifetime also when he, when he obtained spiritual freedom. Yeah. Well, in Christianity, there are many examples of great conversion, like Paul, no? that, in, 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 that suddenly received the illumination of... Uh, uh, Agostino, for example, another one that had a life very, very, uh, like, that full life, you know, a moral, yes. a moral life, and then suddenly they have this, this vision, this change, which I, I always thought it was like an offer, some other or something like that. Yes, but you know, you it, seeing that you just mentioned those two, um, you know, of course, they are they are spiritual experiences. Uh, Led to very um, complex interpretations of the of the of the teaching of Jesus. For example, Augustinus was the great adversary of uh, Saint Jerome, and Saint Jerome um, argued for the meta uh, for the metaphorical interpretation of the Bible, and uh, Saint Augustine argued for the um, literal interpretation of the Bible. And uh, personally, I find that in in Augustine's case, it was because his um, so-called um, awakening wasn't linked to extensive sadhana. Yeah? And then, of course, with Paul, Paul was a, a, a prosecutor, yeah, um, a public prosecutor. He prosecuted uh, Christians for a really long time, and then he had a sudden change. But if you really look and compare Paul's teaching, to actually Jesus' teaching from the three um, synaptic Gospels, the Gospel of uh, Mark, uh, Matthew, and Luke, you will find actually very, very large discrepancy. Yeah. Yeah? Which again I would say is, from my point of view, related to a lack of extensive sadhana on Paul's. Two, two more. Um, let, let me maybe just, yeah. um, just elaborate a little bit more on um, on the sadhana, so you were saying um, why it's spontaneous. Uh, you were asking about the spontaneous. I just had something in mind. Mm. But I always have this doubt when I read uh, the life of saints or of, mystic, of mystics of, of, of several traditions. Yeah. And also there are several that uh, yeah. we, I could name now that they have like uh, a moral lives or, or I don't know the exact word in English, no, lives that yes. are certainly not spiritual, and that they may be interested or attracted by a specific uh, no, uh, call, they receive all the information in one moment. 
and then maybe mm, the information is exactly correct, but they, they, they drastically, drastically change their life. So they get some, some sort of information that uh, my uh, interpretation is a sort, it must be a sort of Samadhi. Okay, um, that's not what I found in my research. Okay. Yeah, in my research I find that, found that if you have some form of reliable, holistic understanding of the world that is always preceded by a long disciplined uh, sadhana. And also in the, um, in the Ramayana, at the end of the Ramayana, there is a statement that says, um, the sages attain spiritual freedom after a long period of sadhana. It doesn't say through, but after a long period of sadhana. So I think that there may be, um, on behalf of the audience, yeah, and maybe on the behalf of the students, um, of, of these teachers, the, the need to um, A, devalue the fact that these people went through a long period. So if, if you argue that, hey, somebody just ha happened spontaneously and just, they just, just totally changed for no reason whatsoever, that always means that it's due to them because they're in some ways special. Yeah. Whereas I would like to more show the cause and effect relationship that it will happen to anybody who is putting in enough sadhana. Yeah. I, I think that there is a certain pre predictability. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what Patanjali says. Actually. Yes, there's a, there's a pre predictability. And the reason why it doesn't appear to be 100% predictable is because um, we can't see from the outside the karmic baggage that somebody carries with them. We can't see that from the outside. So somebody may be appearing to work for a really long time and their progress is slow, but the progress is slow, maybe slow, because from the outset they started with a lot of karmic baggage. Isn't there a divine action? The divine action also follows the cause and effect relationship. And the reason why is because um, uh, the divine is also divine law. Mm. Yeah? So when you look at the teachings of Moses, for example, Moses showed the divine as divine law. Yeah? And it's a divine law and, and the, the law of karma, the law of cause and effect is part of that. Yeah? It's not that um, there is a divine up there, an anthropomorphic divine that spontaneously makes up its mind to enlighten somebody because they like that person and somebody else not because they dislike that person. But the divine grace is, is actually something that is available all the time. And it is so because the divine doesn't have an ego from which to withhold grace. But the, the relationship of the individual to receive divine grace or the inability is because of the, car, the karma that an individual cannot receive. Yeah? So for example, if you look at how a lightning strikes, that's very interesting because it's similar to divine grace. So lightning might be a 150,000 volt current mm -hmm. and it's up there and it's looking where it can strike and then from the ground goes a very weak feel up yeah, with a very low current. And the, the, the lightning, the 150,000 volt current, looks up there, where is a feeler where you can look into it. As soon as it feels up, down. it comes down. This is comparative to the effect of the individual sadhana, yeah, of an individual working on raising their kundalini. This is this feeler, you know, that may only have maybe 10 or 100 volt, and the divine grace, the 150,000 volt current, then links into that. And it can't link into that unless something comes up. So what's the relation between uh, divine uh, law and divine will? I mean, is, is the divine will uh, already codified? We just have to de decodify it? Or is there like, obviously we're not speaking about an anthropomorphic uh, idea, but my, idea, my, my question is, since the divine has no time and space, as no ego, can I talk one to one to the to the divine? Because one to one somehow it's already limited. Yes. And limiting the divine. Yeah. 
No, but many people who are starting a relationship with the divine needs to be able to talk to the divine yes. or yeah. to listen. Because it's certainly, from my experience, possible to develop an individual relationship mm. with the divine. Yes. So it's not, it's not just a formless absolute. Yeah? I would describe the formless absolute, I call that the God transcendent or the transcendental aspect of the divine. But the God immanent, or the immanent, immanent means here with us aspect of the divine, is something like a living intelligence. It's a loving intelligence. The difficulty in developing a personal relationship is in the fact that it is an intelligence of uh, cosmic scope. Yeah. So in, in, in the attempt to relating, of relating to it, we often try to completely diminish it by anthropomorphizing it, by saying, okay, it's a human male, for example, yeah. Yeah, a bearded male sitting on a, on a, on a mountain. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the problem that we also have is we always want to talk to it. Yeah? We always want to ask something for it, whereas I actually think it's more important to listen to it. It has a lot to say to each, each individual, but we find it difficult to listen. Mm -hmm. Uh, a person with uh, no feeling of the divine at all, atheist, like with the, even with the belief that God doesn't exist, can yes. practice yoga? Uh, yes, absolutely. So, um, the, you can have an experience of the divine only after the Rudra Granti is broken. Mm. Yeah? The Rudra Granti is an energetic pranic blockage on the Sushumna, the central energy channel which needs to be, uh, let's say, broken or dissolved through yoga, uh, particularly through techniques like bastika. Um, and unless it is broken or dissolved, it's um, more or less impossible to experience some serious form of divine revelation. Mm. Yeah? So in other words, if somebody hasn't done extensive spiritual practice, we should expect that they say, uh, I have no idea what you mean when you say the divine or God, because I have no experience of it. Yeah? Now let me say one thing, to say I don't know what that is, may be better than to say I believe. Mm. Yeah? Because if you believe, you are proposing that A, you can't know, yeah? that's why you believe, that you can't find out, and then when you believe, which of the beliefs you choose? You know, there's different beliefs, yeah? Are you sure that you're choosing the right one? They're like sometimes literally excluding each other. So for me, I don't mind at all if somebody says, I don't believe, yeah? Um, because if you say you believe, then it's more difficult to find out, to, to know later on. You project an idea. Yeah, and, and this idea may be in the way of, of direct divine revelation, which, of course, the major religions don't want you to have. Mm. If somebody, and maybe it was you in, your, in one of your books, who said, if you want to know what God wants from you, stop telling him what he has, he has to do. do. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if it was you. Okay, um, last question, and then I'll let you. <laughs> Is, I, I, I practiced, read, practiced, and loved uh, well, all your books, but the one on the, on the purpose of uh, the divine purpose of your life, I think it was uh, very simple. And I loved how it opened to every human being. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's just, uh, it proposed, uh, and if somebody's looking at this interview, I really uh, suggest to read this book because it's uh, it's open to everybody you know? and it's just a path towards yourself mm -hmm. and to, towards your your own center now do you find the divine purpose of your life do you do you feel you are in the divine in your di hmm? did you find the yes divine purpose of yes life? absolutely but there is one thing that is really important when you when you talk about divine purpose and that is you're not supposed to tell to others what it is mm. Mm but you're supposed to let it radiate out of you, yeah? So because there is sort of like, you know, there's a saying in the Bible, um, those who have, um, who, um, 
who have received their reward in public, the father cannot reward in, the, in, in secret. Mm -hmm. yeah? So that is, if you got old and you trumpeted out what it is and that you have attained it, you have taken in many ways the, the energy out of it. Yeah? Yeah. So what you want to do is to not talk about it. So don't go out and say, aha, this is my divine purpose, you know, and please all help me to live it. No, what you actually do is you're quiet about it. Yeah? You, you identify what it is and then you embody it and people will automatically respond to it because they feel it radiating out of you. Is there a sort of uh, d d dynamism in the, in the purpose of your life? Can it change like the ashram? Like the, yes, the absolutely. Ashram? So, you know, when, you, when we look at divine purpose and that's similar to the, the question that you asked about divine will, mm. yeah? So you could say that the divine has a certain playfulness about itself, yeah? and it's not a divine dictator. It is giving each of us a swadharma, that means an own purpose, our own duty. And we are yet to discover that, but what, how far we go with it, and what we ex uh, exactly do with it, how far we take it, how much we unfold it, it's a bit like the divine is giving us a nature gift, each individual one a different one, and it's a bit like with the attitude here it is, now surprise me. Mm. Yeah? The divine wants to be surprised. Yeah? So there is, there's an element of co-creation. And it's a bit like if you can open yourself up more to divine influence, yeah? in the Srimad Bhagavatam there's a passage where Krishna says, um, there is no greater thrill than to feel the devotee becoming aware of me. I must immediately rush to that place and embrace the devotee. Yeah? So what is here expressed here, that there is a reciprocal relationship between each individual and the divine. Yeah? In a moment in which the individual wakes up to the divine presence, the divine will turn towards that individual and says, aha, somebody has woken up. Yeah? So then the divine will sort of, let me say, hand you an, an upgrade yeah? and say, okay, let's see how they, how they handle that. I give them a bit more energy. And that's why you see why some people turn into ge geniuses, mm -hmm. you know, like Jesus or Einstein or Martin Luther King. Said, you wonder how can they suddenly do, but the reason is they opened themselves to cosmic intelligence. In that moment where they did that, cosmic intelligence turns towards them and feeds more information through them. And if they then realize that and open even more, more energy goes through them, like similarly with that lightning coming down. Yeah? So there is a, let's say, co-creation of the individual, let's call it destiny, yeah? which is co-created between the divine and the and, and the individual. Is there hope for uh, Samadhi? Whether there's hope for Samadhi, yeah. I would turn it the other way around and I would say that Samadhi is your true nature, the core of your being and your birthright. Yeah? So our problem is as a culture collectively, we have projected us out into the periphery of our psychology. Yeah? So if we have all become Depth, surface psychologists, yeah? but this experience is actually waiting in our core. Yeah? So the, what, what Patanjali calls the Purusha, or what the Upanishads call the Atman, is there yeah? in the core of our being. As, as Krishna says in the Gita, I'm the self in the heart of all beings. So it's not something that we can destroy or get rid of. Yeah? And, and um, it's something that we need to in moments in which, let's say, the surface personality is suspended, I'm not suggesting that it should be suspended all the time, but in a moment in which temporarily the mind and the ego are suspended, we can go into the core of our being, and there the Purusha or Atman, however you want to call it, is waiting for us. So it is our natural state. It's our birthright. It's just that through our culture and um, through the influence of religion, for 10,000 years we have become enculturated mm. that we can't access that thing. But that's where we are at home. So we have the will, the right. Uh, is there also a duty? 
towards somebody? Yes, well, the duty is like this, you know, at this point we have a, um, uh, we have a cultural crisis. Mm. Yeah, we, we started uh, in Babylon, this whole process of an extremely stratified society, which was based on slavery, but also on slavery of animals and destruction of, of, uh, of the ancient rainforest. If you look at the Gilgamesh epos, you know, it all started with cutting down of the rainforest and building huge fortresses, creating stratified society and uh, agriculture. All of this comes together. Yeah? But what comes with that is also religion that tells you that um, there is a, a king in heaven and there is a king on earth and as it be in heaven so it be on earth and you gotta be subject to that king on earth yeah so the king on earth will always take their authority from the king in heaven so in other words what I'm saying there is a an origin of religion not of spirituality but of religion that unfortunately was always a tool of Part of it, not all of it, all of religions have a true core, but part of it was always a tool of manipulation, coercion, and subjugation. Yeah? So, and, and religion, and so now it's come to the point that this toxic dia, uh, um, paradigm um, make the earth thy dominion. That's where the whole trouble started. Yeah? From that sentence started Western science. Yeah. So René Descartes, Francis Bacon, Galileo, they all took their inspiration from that sentence and say, let's create Western science as a tool by which we can subjugate the forces of nature and of course the animals and the plants, agriculture and the lot. And now hundreds of years later and thousands of years after Babylon and Gilgamesh, we ha have come to the point that our um, alienation, our separation from nature has come to the point that we are looking into the abyss of environmental holocaust and ecocide. Mm -hmm. yeah? Now that cannot be changed or averted until humanity comes to a point where we are expanding our sense of self again. Yeah? Because modern humanity has a contracted sense of self. In the extreme, everything that is under my skin is me. What is outside of my skin, I don't care. I may partially include my partner, my children, because they're my genetic progeny, and maybe my real estate investment portfolio. But there it ends. I don't give a damn about anything else. And because there's seven billion people on the planet who all think like that, we can't work together to, let's say, to save the planet. But who we're really saving with that is us. And the reason why indigenous people have never done anything like that, they've never become, been so destructive, is because they have an expanded sense of self. Yeah? So we come back to the whole story that you started with, is, uh, is the body. Yeah? So ultimately, what we need to do is to use yoga and, and other spiritual paths, of course, too not just yoga, there are other spiritual paths that are worth pursuing to bring about a spiritual revolution. Yeah? And in this spiritual revolution, um, this must lead an expanded sense of self so that I can't go to war against another human being because I feel their pain. Yeah? I feel that they are me too, yeah? mm. which is the truth. Yeah? And so also I can't go against, to war against animals because they're my brothers and sisters. I can't go to war against the plants, they're also my brothers and sisters. And I can't go to war against the atmosphere, the ocean and the forests, and the lakes and rivers, because they're my fathers and mothers. This is what I mean with an expanded sense of self. Yeah. Yeah? So this environmentalism that we do at the moment <coughs> won't lead any, anywhere because we get funding from the government only if we can prove that what we do gives more profit than loss. For example, in Australia, there's this discussion going on that, okay, we will save the, the uh, um, how do you call it, the Great Barrier Reef, if you can show us that we can more, make more profit with the tourism industry than the coal barons yeah. can give us by destroying the reef. Yeah? Of course, that's not gonna work. Mm. You know, we need to feel that the entire biosphere is a superorganism, and we live inside of it and as part of it. If you're poisoning the whole thing, we'll poison ourselves. 
This view in yoga is called dharmic. It's the right action. Yeah? So there must be a realization that you can't do these things such as killing the Great Barrier Reef because it's the wrong thing to do. Mm. That's a, uh, help us with the last notion. Um, so uh, there are so many charlatans in the yoga world. And how do you recognize them? Is there a way to recognize them? Somebody's practicing yoga, starting, uh, they go to a studio, to another, they start with a teacher, they like, they don't like, and they, they, they start you know, uh, getting interested in the world of yoga, and they have workshops everywhere and teachers everywhere. What can you tell them to help them say, okay, if this go in this direction, pay attention? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind would probably be if you follow somebody's teaching, they should always defer to the teaching rather than to their personality. Mm. Yeah? So the problem starts if somebody says, by having personal contact with me, um, by surrendering to me, in, to this personage, to this body, you are transformed by this body rather than the techniques. Yeah? So, and a non-charlatan teacher should always defer to the techniques. It's the techniques that do the power, have the power. You practice the techniques and the techniques will fix you. In other words, I'm a sort of, let's so, so say, the equivalent of a spiritual plumber. Mm -hmm. I'll show you how to do it. You do it yourself. Yeah. But a lot of people don't like that because that places the responsibility for their success in their hand. And unfortunately, a lot of people want to just be shepherded like sheep by a leader mm. onto a fat meadow. Yeah? They want to just hand themselves over to another person that, fi that person fixes all of their, their um, problems in return. And why is that the case? In order to understand that, we have to look into Sigmund Freud mm -hmm. because they have not completed the relationship with their own parents. So that means they are looking for a, uh, a spiritual teacher, they're actually looking for a big mama or a big papa. When are you coming back to visit? Well, hopefully next year. <laughs> okay, we'll be waiting for you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Gregor. It was amazing talking to you. Thank you.